So let me start out with the discussion of beta decay, which is what we were talking about last Tuesday. And I asked you to hold then to believe in this fiction that in a beta decay, this was all we had. So this is the fiction that we were looking at last time. So do you, what's a beta decay? Like what uh, phenomenon or interaction are we referring to in a beta decay? Yeah, so beta rays are electrons. So beta decay is a nuclear interaction which ends up with a process that ends up with the emission of an electron, right? And the particular process that we are looking at was where a tritium hydrogen three goes into helium three and emits an electron. That's what we looked at last time, right? And now that we are talking about elementary particles, let me give you an even more elementary version of it. It's not as easy to set up an experiment for, for reasons that I'll explain. But really what this is, is this is, uh, so what this is, let me represent it in a more, um, ter in terms of the elementary particles. What this is, is one proton and two neutrons, right, going into helium-3 or two protons plus one neutron and an electron. So you have what's sometimes known as a spectator particles, particles that are not really doing anything. That's just there to spectate. <laughs> so let me, let's get rid of those spectator particles. I have one proton here that, you know, that's apparently not doing anything. And I have um, one neutron here that's apparently not doing anything either. So get rid of that. So at the very basic elementary level, what you have is one neutron turning into a proton in the process emitting an electron. Okay. So, so that's the very elementary um, representation of what's happening here. Neutron becomes a proton emitting an electron. And if we were to try to draw a Feynman diagram, it might look something like this, uh, which is not going to look like the elementary vertex for electromagnetism because this process is not happening by electromagnetism. There is no electromagnetic process that would uh, turn a particle into another particle. So, um, but you know, let me just uh, draw a, a kind of rudimentary version of a Feynman diagram. It would be, um, I have a neutron coming in, that neutron turns into proton for some reason, and it also emits an electron in the same process. And this is the first text where all of that's happening. Good, questions? Um, so, it, so this is a new type of interaction, new type of primitive vertex, new type of stuff. So, um, so you know, we are not going to hold this to you know. This must uh, be broken down into electromagnetic primitive vertexes. We don't need to have that because it's an entirely new interaction. But the one rule we want to still hold up is that at this vertex all conservation laws must hold, right? And last time, last Tuesday, we actually looked at one consequence of holding to this conservation of energy and momentum. Do people remember that calculation we ended with on Tuesday? So, like, what was the conclusion we came to looking at decay of tritium into helium-3 and electron? Like the coil energy can almost be ignored, so all the... Yeah, that's one. And we calculated on electron energy, right? Yeah. So the consequence of holding to conservation of energy momentum is that this is actually a general rule. When you have a single particle that decays into two particles, then these two particles must have definite energy and momentum, right? Because there's no other possibility. But when people were actually doing careful measurements with the beta decay, actually measure the energies of these outgoing electrons, 
This is what they found. So let me bring up that note here because I have a plot that I want to use. When they actually did a careful measurement with beta decay, what they, so this is actually a plot of tritium decay that I, um, that I uh, not borrowed. I'm doing it properly because I actually cite the Katrin collaboration that published it. Um, so this is the plot of the uh, beta energy of tritium decay. Um, so beta energy meaning energy of the electron that's coming out of the beta decay. And this is what they measure. I mean, this is the kind of modern, very refined version. But this has been known since the 30s, 20s, since people started looking at beta decay. You have a beta spectrum. The electron comes out with a spectrum of energies. In fact, the most likely energy for the, so this 18 kilo electron volt is what we calculated on Tuesday, right? But electrons, very few actually come out with the 18 kilo electron volt. Most of them come out with a fraction of that, 3 kilo electron volt. And um, so this is a kind of a crisis because the calculation we did on Tuesday, we didn't assume a lot there. We, the only thing we really assumed was that whatever this interaction is, energy and momentum must be conserved. And the result we derived on Tuesday would be, oh, I, that's already blue. Result on, we derived on Tuesday, what the result was demanding was that this spectrum of electron energy must be flat and then peak at 18 kilo electron volts. That's the spectrum that our calculation was predicting. And this is the experimental plot. So it's a kind of a crisis. And uh, that's, a, you know, when you're in a scientific crisis, that's the exciting time to live in. That's a, when you get to propose new ideas and, you know, have people test it or whatever. So there are multiple, um, uh, multiple competing proposals. One of them came from Niels Bohr, which I talk about in this thing. One of the proposals of Niels Bohr was he was suggesting maybe energy conservation isn't held strictly in quantum mechanics. And you have to understand this was in the 20s, 30s. People didn't really understand quantum mechanics. Einstein, who got Nobel Prize for photoelectric effect, he, uh, he never subscribed to Copenhagen and interpretation of quantum mechanics. So even Einstein was having difficulty with correctly understanding quantum mechanics. So, and what I will tell you is, skip to the modern times and tell you is that he was wrong. That when Niels Bohr suggests that maybe energy and momentum is not conserved in beta decay, it was just uh, flat out wrong. But it remains that you still have to explain. Like, if energy and momentum is conserved, like, what could we have missed? What could we have missed that what the experimental result we are getting does not agree with our theoretical calculation? It may release something else. Yeah, we might have missed something literally. There might be a particle that we could not detect. This was the proposal by Wolfgang Pauli of Pauli Exclusion Principle. And so what Pauli suggested was we actually literally missed something. So in this outgoing particles, there's one more particle there that, um, that we literally missed. <laughs> so uh, we, today we call it neutrino. And in fact, I'm being very um, specific about it, it's uh, actually an antineutrino. <laughs> Specifically, it's an electron antineutrino. <laughs> um, but you know, back then, they weren't making this distinction, so let's just call it neutrino for now. It's just a placeholder for a particle that they couldn't see in the 30s, but um, they were guessing, well, maybe we need to, uh, one particle going into two that leads to a prediction that just doesn't hold. So maybe there's one more particle that we are going to call neutrino that's going out. Um, and it turns out he's correct. And in fact, there's even with what little we know, we can actually kind of get at why this uh, is correct. Um, um, for one, does everyone, so to clear off the uh, kind of big things first, does everyone see that this hypothesis would solve the issue with conserving energy and momentum and still getting this spectrum for electron. Like you can see that? 
kind of, you can see if I have three particles going up, then now I have enough degree of freedom. I could have put all the kinetic energy onto this neutrino. So the electron comes out with a zero energy. Or, um, yeah, or I could somehow arrange things so that this neutrino comes out with a practically zero kinetic energy, then um, so that I have this, uh, th this maximum possible energy that the electron could have in the absence of the neutrino. And um, so, you know, introducing this neutrino solves that uh, beta decay spectrum problem. And it turns out there's additional problems that this neutrino solves that people in the 20s and 30s didn't know back then. But I think you guys actually have enough information to kind of figure this out with some guidance. So I said all conservation laws must be, hold, must be satisfied in, at this vertex. But we've been talking about only two conservation laws, energy and momentum. We haven't talked at all about the angular momentum. And let, you know, back then, they couldn't because they knew nothing about the spin angular momentum, but we do. So we can consider if uh, we didn't have this neutrino, if a spin angular momentum could be conserved. Then, what's the spin angular momentum of the electron? Half, right? It's a spin half particle. We went over that like last week. Um, so electron has a spin of uh, half, uh, let me call it h bar. Does anyone here know the, so we didn't explicitly talk about it. Does anyone here know the spin of proton? No? Well, you can kind of guess. I call the proton a fermion. So it must be some kind of spin up. It turns out it's exactly spin half. And I think back then they actually knew proton was a spin half based on measurements with a hydrogen atom. Because both of them being spin half makes a hydrogen atom's overall angular momentum to be either one or zero. And if you've heard of like para hydrogen and ortho hydrogen, wait, is that it? I'm not, you know, I'm not entirely sure. Never mind. Um, so these are spin half particles. So I guess the excuse for the physicists in the 20s and 30s is that they didn't know much about neutron. So they didn't know the spin of neutron. Well, now we do. <laughs> neutron is a fermion. So what do you guess is the spin of neutron? Also half. So these are three spin half particles. So imagine, just imagine that we didn't have this neutro, neutrino that this is all the interaction we had. Do you see any issues here? Right? What do you get when you add two spin half particles? I know I said that it was optional last Thursday, but the result of our calculations last Thursday is that with the two spin half particles, you could get spin zero or you could get spin one, right? Well, this is neither. So this interaction, unless there's a third particle, doesn't conserve angular momentum. So what uh, addition of neutrino does is it, it saves angular, conservation, angular momentum conservation in this reaction. So uh, once people figured it out, then this neutrino was actually accepted pretty quickly. But so Pauli suggested the idea of neutrino in the 30s, 35 or something. And um, the neutrino actually wasn't detected in a direct measurement until 1950 something. And, um, but you know, in that intervening two decades, um, people were really questioning that this exists because uh, having this neutrino exist solved an additional problem of angular momentum conservation question. Uh -huh. So there are actually some properties of neutrino that we can infer from all the conservation laws that must be satisfied. And that's probably something we should go over so that maybe that's what your question was, no? No, my question was why do we detect photons all the time but we don't detect neutrinos? But then I forgot photons are in the electric field. Yeah, yeah. so it interacts with the charge. Yeah. So photons, they themselves don't have a charge, so, but they interact with the charges. So, um, so let me just, let's just uh, list the possible properties 
of neutrino. So I guess one thing is kind of comes out of this discussion here. What's the spin of a uh, neutrino? Yeah, it's a half spin particle. So uh, it's a spin half particle, which means is a, it's an additional particle we can now add to this list of possibly elementary particles that belongs with the fermions. So all right, so we have a neutrino here. That's a one more particle that we didn't know existed. And back then, in the 30s and 40s, they still haven't detected it. But uh, there's a compelling argument to say that it actually is there. Uh, any other properties of neutrino that it must hold, kind of based on the descriptions, observations? Electrical neutral, kind of in the name, but I guess that's a circular reasoning. So the reason it's electrically neutral is because somehow we are not seeing it. So if we were electrically charged, then we would have seen it. So that's really the argument for why neutrino must be neutral because uh, it's sort of like, uh, yeah. Um, so it must be electrically neutral. And there's one more thing that's um, not immediately obvious, but to an experimentalist who's making careful measurements, they could have eventually kind of inferred from their data. And it comes from here. This is where it's a numerical argument. So you kind of have to have a trust in the numbers you're working with. So um, it's the fact that this 18 kilo electron volt is the theoretical number you calculate with no neutrino. And there are electrons with about that much energy. So that means whatever rest energy is in the neutrino must be pretty small. Because if a neutrino had to take up significant rest energy, then you would see this curve come short of this 18 kilo electron volt. So based on that, uh, what they initially guessed was they initially guessed that they were massless. But this is actually a fairly new development in particle physics. The last conclusive evidence was only discovered in um, 2001. And it turns out it's not massless, but it's, uh, I guess I can say, it's uh, nearly <laughs> massless. And the kind of experiment that Katrin collaboration does, which is still active collaboration, is they're still trying to determine the mass of neutrino. And there are theoretical reasons why neutrino must be only nearly massless, not exactly massless. But I think we'll skip that, only to show you the, um, plot that illustrates what kind of measurement this Katrin collaboration is trying to make. Um, I think I need to scroll down. Okay. So once again, this is all optional. I wouldn't test you anything that's here. That's not also in your assignment. So blah, blah, blah. And so this is what they're trying to measure. And I'm pretty sure this is still plot from Katrin collaboration. <laughs> that's why they were publishing this at all, because that's what they're trying to measure. So you see that little, so it, this might still be a two plot. Um, but what they are plotting here now is a kind of different version, hypothetical plot. So I don't know how many energies they are plotting. Um, yeah, so this blue curve would be if the neutrino was exactly massless. And this red curve is if the neutrino had a mass of one EV. And I think the current uh, upper limit on the electron neutrino mass is two EV. So like one electron volt out of a major energy measurement of 18,000 electron volts. <laughs> and if this is a possibility, if a neutrino has mass of, I guess is that 0.3 EV or something like that? Um, so this is uh, in the field of what's called a precision measurement. And they are trying to not so much test, because we kind of know that some flavors of neutrinos that must have mass. They're they trying to determine, OK, so what is that much mass for the electron neutrino? Um, but 
So neutrino is the very first of new particles we have to add because in order to explain beta decay and the features observed in beta decay, that's this uh, larger feature here, not the tiny feature that they're trying to measure, but this larger feature. In order to explain that, we need to hypothesize existence of a new particle. 